Amen. Good morning. Hey, everybody. How y'all doing? Come on. Give God a hand clap of praise. Oh, y'all can do better than that. I said give God a hand clap of praise. Amen. If y'all was clapping for me, that would have been all right. But y'all got to give God a true hand clap of praise. Amen. Amen. It is good to see each and every one of you all. Y'all got to excuse my voice a little bit. It decided to that after I ate all that good turkey and dressing and fixings that it wanted to leave. And I done begged it to come back, so I, I sound kind of croaky this morning, but it's all as well. Amen. Amen. Uh, at this time, we're going to have our deacons come and give us our devotion, and then we're going to have some, uh, some good old-fashioned church. Amen. Amen. Father, Lord, I thank you for blessing me with another day, Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, I thank you for waking me this morning, Heavenly Father, starting this day, Heavenly Father. 
Heavenly Father, I thank you that when you woke me this morning, Heavenly Father, that you gave me a mind, Heavenly Father, that I want to come out to the house of worship one more time, Heavenly Father. And as I did, Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, that you gave me the traveling grace to allow me to arrive here one more time, Heavenly Father. And Heavenly Father, I come before you this morning, Heavenly Father, I can't help but think, Heavenly Father, that the other day, Heavenly Father, we celebrate the day that man called Thanksgiving, Heavenly Father. And for those of us who truly know you, Heavenly Father, we know that every day that you make, Heavenly Father, is Thanksgiving, Heavenly Father. And we should be thankful every day, Heavenly Father. Every day that you make, Heavenly Father, you allow us to see, Heavenly Father, we have something to be thankful for, Heavenly Father. Whether we have our help or not, Heavenly Father, you allow us to just be in this world, Heavenly Father, we should be thankful, Heavenly Father. Then you give us the added bones of having a little help and spirit, Heavenly Father, even more you thank you for, Heavenly Father. I thank you, Heavenly Father, that you bless me with food every day, Heavenly Father. Will I have a feast to eat, Heavenly Father? Will I just have crackers and bologna, Heavenly Father? I am thankful, Heavenly Father, for you are truly worthy to be praised, Heavenly Father. I thank you, Heavenly Father, for allowing me to be with my brothers and sisters here at the Antioch Church, Heavenly Father. Lord, I thank you for the pastor that you bless us with, Heavenly Father. I thank you for the faithfulness that the young man brings each and every week, Heavenly Father. Lord, I just ask that you, as he comes to bring your word today, Heavenly Father, that you will open our minds and hearts, Heavenly Father, that we will receive your word, Heavenly Father, that we will understand it, Heavenly Father, and that we will apply it to our lives, Heavenly Father. And we all do this, Heavenly Father. We will leave this place in a better shape than we were when we arrived, Heavenly Father. I just thank you again, Heavenly Father, for all your many blessings. Lord, it's my prayer to you today in the name of thy son, Jesus Christ, I do pray. Amen. this morning. Amen. Uh, very quickly, we're going to do our morning scripture and then we're going to uh, turn over to our uh, musical director for our morning uh, congregational hymn. Uh, Psalms 121. say I got it. Amen. If you need me to wait, just say wait on me. All right. Amen. Psalms 121. I'm just going to read a couple of the verses that follow. Amen. Uh, if you got it, amen. I will lift up my eyes to the hills from which comes my help. My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to be moved. He will, who keeps you, will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He shall preserve your soul. The Lord shall preserve your going out. And you're coming in from this time forth and 
forevermore. Amen. I read to you Psalms 121. It's in entirety. Amen. Now time for our morning congregational hymn. Amen. Y'all come on, stand on your feet this morning. Let's give God a praise just for a little while. I need y'all to let, let's have some old church. Y'all go help me have some old church. Y'all got two hands. I need y'all to put them together just like this real quick. The Bible says that you ought to give your body a living sacrifice. You all that you have to give God the praise. And y'all know the songs. Y'all don't even need your hymn books. Hallelujah. 
somebody say that God inhabits the praises of his people. And I don't know about you, but I just got a few questions to ask real quickly. How many of God's people in here? Amen. I know that if you are here and I'm here, you and I got a reason to praise God on this morning. You don't got to praise him for me. I don't got to praise him for you. But we can praise him together. Amen. For he's been a good God and a God that is worthy to be praised. Sister Battle, wear your hand. God bless you. today you all well you know I, I'm with the Holy Bible he only loves you and basic instructions before leaving earth amen, amen. Amen. control your walk be careful where you put your feet down amen, amen. amen. come on y'all put your hands together for all for a time Amen. I don't know about y'all, but I was so glad when they said, let us go into the house of the Lord. And I was even gladder when I could take some into the house with me. God bless. Amen. Uh, there's four ways to give. I thought he was going to do the offering. He had the mic. Amen. Uh, there's four ways you can give in person uh, here in the house. Amen. If you want to mail it in securely, 1107 North Hickory Street, Chattanooga, Tennessee, 37406. Amen. Digitally, uh, give the five the Antioch Primitive Baptist Church of Chattanooga, man, or cash app dollar sign the Antioch Church. Amen. Y'all ready to give? Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Amen. We're going to do uh, our giving affirmation. Amen. I'm going to attempt to read it, I guess. Uh, and then we're going to go uh, forth. As I give, As I, give I understand. That my, that my gift belongs to the Lord. Belongs to the Lord. I don't just give. I, don't just give. I, give, in I give in obedience to God's command. To God's command. And, through faith, and through faith, I believe, I believe that, God is able that God is able to make all grace, to make all grace abound, to me, abound to me that I have it, sufficiency, sufficiency in all things, in all things may have an abundance for every good work. Hallelujah. 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 It's offering time. Amen. Good morning to everyone. Moving a little slower. 
know this morning, old body's not working right this morning. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for letting us come out this morning. We thank you for this offering that we're about to receive. Heavenly Father, we can't do anything with it. We ask that you bless it, multiply it, so it may be used to uplift your kingdom. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. As we stand to worship in song, with it being Thanksgiving week, um, I am in a text group called Widow Women Living for Jesus. And one of the ladies always sends out food for thought. And this is one that I wanted to share as we start to worship in song. It says, thankfulness opens the door to God's presence. There are many ways to open that door. But an attitude of gratitude is the most effective way. Learn the art of giving thanks in all circumstances. Try seeing how many times a day you can thank him. It will open that door and awaken your awareness of the multitude of blessings. And I'm going to add to the end of that the multitude of blessings that we take for granted. We take for granted that you woke up this morning. You think you did it, but God did it. You think you got yourself dressed this morning, but God got you dressed this morning. You think that you were the one that made that coffee or that breakfast, but God provided that coffee and that breakfast for you to have. So therefore, when you think on the things that you have accomplished just in these few moments that you've been awake, awaken within your heart the many times that if you haven't said thank you, that you would say thank you because of the fact that every praise is to our God.
you know, it's just a blessing to be in the house of the Lord one more time. You know, somebody wanted to be in the house of the Lord this morning, but for whatever reason was unable to be in the house of the Lord. So while we are here, y'all, we want you to bless the Lord with us. We're not just up here to sing. I don't know about y'all, but I get excited when I come to church. This is the only place I really get to get excited. They laugh at me when we come to choir rehearsal because I tell them I'm on my date because of the fact that I get to be with them. We get to sing songs of praise as we prepare to worship him through song. So therefore, y'all, bless the Lord with us. There is something that you can be so grateful for that you don't mind just blessing the Lord. Don't look at what around. Don't let nobody hinder your praise. Just bless the Lord with us. Because y'all know he worthy. Y'all know he worthy. I know y'all ain't good this past weekend. Some of y'all still eating on it. So therefore, that's a blessing. So bless the Lord with us.
You know, we've already said that every praise is to our God. We've already said to bless the Lord with me. And because of those things, y'all, you should be grateful. Grateful for the things that he's done. Grateful for the things that he's doing. Grateful for the things that he will do. Grateful for unseen and seen blessings. Grateful for the protection that he has put upon you. For the dangerous seen and unseen that he's protected you from. You ought to be grateful. Grateful for good family. Grateful for good friends. Grateful for the roof over your head. Grateful for the car that you drive. Grateful for life. Grateful for health. Grateful for strength. Grateful to be able to say thank you because you have truly been good to me. And for all of that, one word y'all says it. Grateful.
praising God there as if we are seeing a performance, but you can keep praising him there because you realize that there's something about his grace and his mercy that makes us grateful that while we are living in our lives and going about our days, we ought to always remember, according to the word of God, to always give thanks in every circumstance, no matter what you're going through, no matter what it looks like, still give thanks. Well, you don't understand that what you're going through is only for a time, the Bible says, it is only for a season. And at the appointed time, God will. He's going to deliver his people from the hands of, of the enemy. That's something to be grateful for when we consider Antioch that we were all bought with a price. When we consider that we were bought, oh, Saint would say, at the lamb sale, we was bought with the price that we couldn't pay. And we were bought by a person that didn't have to pay it. But he did. That we ought to be grateful. Anybody here grateful? Not, not, not because I asked you, but because you can think down in your life many reasons, Deacon Michelle, why I ought to be grateful. When I realized that what the enemy really wanted for my life is to kill me, when everything that I did that I know I shouldn't have done, God delivered me from it, I'm grateful. <laughs> I don't look like what I've been through, I'm grateful. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, all of us in here, Sister Florence, are grateful. And whether we like to tell God or not, the truth is, we're grateful. Is there any believers in here that won't mind giving God praise just for the next five seconds? Just go ahead and give him praise. Jonah chapter one. Jonah chapter number one. My heart. Jonah chapter 1. All the issues of my heart. Jonah chapter number 1. You can sing it with us. Flowing. Flowing from my heart. Are the issues of my heart. song was really singing that everything that is going on in me, I'm going to give it up. I'm going to pour it out to you. He says, flowing. Flowing from. This was done during a prayer. You think about it, what he's saying is, Sister Marvis, flowing from my heart. Well, I'm telling you all the things that are going on are the issues. I'm telling you the many things God and I'm going through. You know the stuff that I'm going through. But then he goes to say that simply, I'm grateful. It's grateful. It's flowing. Yeah. My heart are the issues of my heart. Thank you, Lord. Are the issues of my heart. It's gratefulness. Just say it is gratefulness. It's gratefulness. If you got Jonah chapter one, say I got it. If you're still looking for it, say wait a minute. Amen. Y'all with me today? Uh, we're looking at verses number 1 through 17. Number 1 through 17. I know protocol. I'm going to skip protocol on today because I know who to call. And because I know who to call, I don't have to do protocol because y'all know who I know. Because y'all know them too. Amen. But if I must, to, to kill the curiosity of all, that I stand and I'm like Paul. I preach nothing but Christ. Anything other than Christ, woe unto me if I don't preach Christ. Amen? Amen. So that's all. That's the only protocol I got for you today. I preach Christ. Let's look at verse number 17 for the sake of time today. You got it? Say, I got it. I'm going to read from the New uh, Living, uh, no, New King James Version. 
or translation rather. Um, I want to look at verse number 17. It might read a little different, but it'll read the same thing. Uh, verse number 17 starts with the word in my book. It says, now. Somebody say, now. The Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Let me read it one more time. Now, the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. Who did it? Who did it? The Lord. He prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. As we keep in our series of who is God, today's theme is going to deal with the will of God. We dealt with, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we dealt with God, who he was, who is God. We dealt with what was his nature. And this week we're going to deal with what is his will. And so if you won't mind and you don't, uh, you, you're safe enough to speak to the person that you came here with, look at them right square in the eye. If they ain't too mean, and if they're mean, say it anyway. The preacher want to preach about. The preacher want to preach about. God's will. God's will. God's way. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. God's will, God's way. So, Kim, um, one day I had a project that I wanted to do here at the church. And most times, like the projects that I have to do um, or that I want to do, I desire to do, I usually call David and I spitball David my idea. I'll tell David, David, I pretty much already thought about it. All we need is X, Y, Z, A, B, C. And if he thinks it's a good idea or that we need more stuff, or that we, we'll talk about it. We, it's called planning. It's called preparing and knowing beforehand um, what we're going to do before we do it. It's most like um, one day, Minister Miller, because I am a mechanic outside of, of what I do here, um, Minister Miller uh, he, he called me out of my retirement. He called me one day and he said, uh, uh, bro, where you at? I said, I'm at the house. He said, okay, uh, I want you to help me put my light bulb in my, my car. I said, okay, here's what you need to do. Go by the church, grab my toolbox, come on by the house. As he was coming, I told him, I said, now this is a very easy job. He says, no, it ain't that easy. I said, yeah, it is. I'm, 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 I pretty much know what we got to do. I said, all we got to do is turn the wheel as deep as we can, take out a few of the rivets, and pull the flywheel back, and then you can reach your hand in there and grab the light bulb. He didn't know it was that easy until I showed it to him, but here's what I knew. Because of my planning and preparing, I knew that while I was asked to do something, I knew what needed to be done. Therefore, the person who asked, all I had to do was give them instruction. Don't go to sleep too quickly. Because what I want to talk to you about today is the will of God. This is the instruction of God. This is something that he planned. He didn't come to you in the conference about it. He didn't ask you your opinion about it. What he did was he planned it over behind the purple hills of glory before there was a when or a where. Before there was a here or there. It's called his predestined will. And we as primitive Baptists, we believe, and not just primitive Baptists, I believe anybody who read the word of God will believe that before we became who we are, God already made notice of us and the world that we would live in. And if he made notice of the world that we would live in and he made notice of us, then Jasmine, that teaches me that I don't have to worry about nothing as long as I live in the will. <laughs> Y'all ain't hearing me because y'all got to understand what God's will is and how he left it on record. Ha, ah, here it is. When God delivered um, the children of Israel, it was his declaration that all men be saved. That was his will. That's what he wanted. But what we know about God's will 
is that it's broken up by some theological uh, beliefs. It's broken up into five different parts. Y'all can write it down real quickly. Y'all can help me put it in the comment section to help somebody else real quickly. It's first the predestined will. This means God knew it, his sovereign control. This is what he's going to do, and you can't do nothing to change it. But then there is a moral will of God, how he intends on us to live. He intends on us to be holy for he is holy. That's what we learned about his nature on last week. Number three, it is the desired will of God. This is what, does, uh, this is what God desires for our life. I want to tell you something, Sister Florence, whether you knew it or not, uh, when your daddy, uh, in the form of his son, Jesus Christ, left this world, he left on record a will. All right, let me talk to somebody who's dealt with the bereavement here, and we know what last wills and testaments are. We know that pretty much what that last will is written for is for everybody who is to read it after they pass away to keep to every wish the person wanted while they had mind to write it down. Y'all ain't hearing me. And so what God does with his word is he gives us his word after he's already stepped back behind the purple hills. After he's already gone back to his throne. After his son has gone back to sit on the right hand side. And after he sent the Holy Spirit to comfort and guide us, he left on record his will. What are you telling me, Sister Flo? Uh, yeah, I'm telling you that God already set out what he wanted us to do. But the problem about us, Sister Andrea, is that oftentimes, like families do now, we take the will and we want to rewrite it. Thank you, Holy Spirit. I, I'm trying to walk this like, I, like, like, like he gave it to me. And so here it is. Here it is. In our text, we got to understand that as Christians, we have a distinct advantage over unbelievers when it comes to facing decisions. We have an advantage over folk who don't know God simply because we know God. And when we know God, the person, and we know his nature being holy, then we know he knows everything there is to know. And if he knows there's everything there is to know, then we can lean and depend on him knowing that we have an advantage facing some hard decisions in life because we don't have to face them by ourselves. We not only know that our sovereign God has already planned the way and the best way for us, but we have an infallible information about his priorities that will help us follow in his plans. Look at Jeremiah 29 and 11. If you read it, he says to Jeremiah, I know the plans I have towards you. He didn't say, I guess them. He didn't say, I think about them. He didn't say, I, 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 I hypothesize them. He says, I know the plans I have towards you. Bro, Roland, here's what I got to uh, help you on today. If he knows the plans that he has towards you, then why are you living in the shame that you are living in, understanding that when God set out over nothing and compiled all things that it was and called all things into existence, don't you know that he knew you would be in sin? Don't you know that he knew you would deal with depression? Don't you know that he would deal with heartache? Don't you know he knew that you would deal with headache? And while he knew you would deal with all of these things, he told you to be of good courage for I've already overcome the world. That's his will. He knows it. Deacon Carter, you can't change it. If his will is for you to preach the word, you can't change it. How do you know that, uh, bro, preacher? I'm glad to ask, Sister Mary. Because I ran. I knew what the will of God was, but I ran. I'm already in the text. Y'all just ain't reading it. I knew what he wanted me to do, but I ran because what he wanted me to do wasn't in my will to do it. <laughs> so now, you understand where I am in the text. Verse number one, we meet a man by the name of Jonah. And in this text, we got a few things we need to break down dealing with God's will. The first thing is his call. It's right there in verses number one through three. The Bible says in, in verse number one, now. Somebody see that? It didn't say a time later. It said now. And what we got to understand about God's will uh, is that God's will is not something that you can choose and have an option on when you're going to abide by it. 
Oh, y'all got quiet. Here it is. God's will is a right now thing. Now, you might not heed to his will, which means that you're going to have to hear the consequences. But his will is there, and his will is now. His will was set out over, over 2,000 uh, years ago. When he said, let there be, he was creating his will. And so here's, here's what he says. He says, now, the word of the Lord came unto Jonah. I need us to look at something. I need us to know something about God's will. God's will is not coming, but it's here. Write that down. Number one, God's will is here. <laughs> it ain't coming, it's here. But here's what I want us to break down. Here it is. Look at the privilege we have, all right? As being children of God, Sister Kim, we got a privilege. If we know that his will is here and it's relevant and it's now, we ought to look and understand that we have the privilege to even carry it out. Oh, y'all got, got, got some ditty on me this morning? So, so somebody thought that you were qualified to hear from God? <laughs> you thought that you were good enough to hear the voice of God? Can I tell you it takes a special kind of person to be able to hear the voice of God? What special kind of person, bro, preacher? I'm glad to act. It takes somebody who's not trying to hear what he wants to hear but is willing to submit himself and commit himself to what the Lord is saying and whether or not I like it, I know it is the word and the will and the way of the God that loves me. Here it is. We got a privilege. The word of the Lord came to Jonah. Now, don't get it mixed. Jonah was a prophet. He was a man of God. So it's not, it's not unnatural or not normal that the word of the Lord would come to him. But what I need us to understand as all ministers of the gospel, because all of us in here are, if you read your Bible, in Matthew where I read it, all of us in here are ministers. We got different levels on which we are to minister to. I might need to minister to the masses. You might need to minister to the mister. You might need to minister to the missus. I might need to minister to the kids. You might need to minister to the street folk. Somebody got some, a guy got somewhere or somebody for everybody. And if you don't want to believe that, look in his word where it says that we are many members, but we are one body. Woo, I feel a preach coming in here today. Here it is, the privilege. We got a privilege. The word of the Lord came to him. You, you, you don't, don't, don't ever feel like you deserve God to talk to you. Always know that it is a privilege and an honor to be able to have, first, a relationship with such a God. Bro, Roland, I was reading in my Bible. And here's why I say it's, so, it's such a privilege to have a relationship with God. Didn't call it's because I was reading in my Bible where God and man had become enemies to one another. You read that too, Sister Mary. God and man became enemies to one another. And Sister Florence, according to my Bible and what I've heard preachers preach forever, there needed to be an advocate. Somebody who would bridge the gap between God and his people. <laughs> it's a privilege. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and grief to bear. What a it is to carry everything to God. Y'all don't ever feel like you've made it to the point of celebrity status in God that you can walk right up to him and deserve that he talks to you. You better know how to go to him. It's a privilege. Secondly, look at the priority. The word of the Lord came, and here's what it says. It came now. Priority says that if God calls you to be a missionary, you be a missionary. If God calls you uh, uh, to be, to be a, 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 an evangelist, you be an evangelist. What, what are you saying, brother preacher? Don't let, thank you, Holy Spirit, a denominational belief keep you from following a fundamental fact of the word of God. All right, I'm not, I'm not meddling. I'm just, I just needed us to know that. We have a priority. And our priority is if God calls you to do it, you do it. Hmm. All right. See, here it is. 
Look at the precision. He didn't just send his word, uh, Sister uh, Morris, to anybody. The Bible says the word of the Lord came to Jonah. Why are you putting emphasis on that? Because here's the thing. God speaks all the time. He speaks through his nature. He speaks through the stars. He speaks through the sun and the moon. But there are some words that he got to come and give directly to you. <laughs> There's some stuff that he ain't going to give to David, Michelle, Deacon Carter, and me. He just going to give it to Sir Sam. <laughs> we ain't got to know what it is until God has released the person with the word to give the word. But we need to always know that God's word ain't always general. Well, preacher, what are you really trying to say? I'm glad you asked. Give me this moment to tell you real quickly. Here's why folk come to church sometime and leave the same way they came. Because they came looking for something and didn't even ask God if today was the day that God was going to answer the prayer. Because the truth of the matter is coming to worship is not necessarily you coming to ask God for something. You coming to worship is you coming to give God something. And in your giving God something, God might drop a word off in the house that only might fall in the laps of maybe two or three. And while everybody else was looking for the hoop and the cross, somebody got blessed because the word wasn't supposed to be general on that Sunday. All right, I'm meddling in something else. Let me get back to here. Here's the precision. The precision was right there to Jonah. Uh-huh. But look at the purpose. Look at what he told him. Verse number three. Says, but Jonah, he says, but Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord because he was told to go to Nineveh. And why did he was told to go to Nineveh? Here it was. It was a great city. But they were known for the wickedness that had come up. Now, there are no differences to battle like anybody else. They, they were serving God at one time. Because the Bible implies that wickedness came up. Can I, can I teach the Bible how I feel it? This simply means that not all the time are church folk not going to be doing what God's supposed to be. Sometimes you'll see us doing exactly what we should be doing. But then sometimes wickedness comes up. <laughs> and when wickedness comes up, God has to call somebody to call it out. Oh, y'all ain't hearing me. Because somebody said, I wonder why it is that when I go to church, the preacher feel like he meddling all in my business. He talking about what I've been doing and telling me what I should and should not do. But here's why. Because when God sees wickedness come up, he dispatches his prophet to call it out. <laughs> Why does he call it out, though, bro, preacher? He calls it out because as long as it's in you, it'll always make a loop of dying and living again. Oh, thank you, Holy Spirit. What does that mean for me, though, bro, preacher? That simply means that while you have been walking in the right way and you've been doing what the Lord tells you to do, don't get too up at it too quickly and too high on your horse because just like you could be doing good today, you can go down tomorrow. All right. That's the purpose. He says to go out to that city. He says, and not just preach to them. He says, cry out to them. So the event, he didn't just tell me to get up and give you a word. He pretty much told me to put my chest in it. He said, I need you to tell them with passion, desire, with everything that's in you that I've placed in you. Tell them that, that, that their wickedness got to cease. So guess what Jonah did? I'm going. Jonah gets up and he flees to Tarshish. But look at what the Bible says. He only flees there from the presence of the Lord. Well, preacher, uh, what about God's will? I tell you, you can't outrun it. <laughs> That's your second point. <laughs> you, you, you can't outrun God's will. Here it is. What Jonah does is Jonah gets a word. He gets up, and instead of doing what God tells him to do, he tries to rewrite the wheel. And God says he wants it this way, 
Jonah decides because of his personal indignation with the city, I'm not going to do what the Lord tells me to do. Oh, bro, preacher, what you saying? Because I don't like them, God, and I don't want them to be saved. I'm not going to do what you told me to do because I don't want you to save them because I know the type of God you are. So as as I know what type of God you are. Then God, if I ask you to do it, if I go down there and preach, I know you're going to deliver them. I don't want you to deliver them because I don't like them. That's my layman's term, but that's what the Bible said. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Here's what it says. He says he's fleed from God's presence and then he went down to Joppa and he found a ship. He found a ship going the opposite way of where God told him to go. And here's another thing about God's will I need you to catch real quickly. While God's will is here, I need you to know that it's also clear. What do you mean? Here it is, number two. Arise and go to Nineveh. He didn't have to, it didn't, wasn't around the bush, says Kim. It wasn't, it wasn't a, 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 a complex theory. It wasn't a, a trigonometry math. It was simple. Get up and go. It was a simple command, a simple call. But look at the place, look at the place. The place was Nineveh, the great city. But what was the plan? The plan was for him to cry out, but the plan wasn't designed then. God knew what the city of Nineveh would be about when he created the city. And he knew this because he's an all-knowing God. Oh, what are you talking about, brother preacher? I'm talking about his will. His will is so sovereign that while he was writing our story, he did not have to go into an imagination of what it would be like. He simply wrote what he wanted. And then he set us out here to follow the plan. But look at the provocation. The provocation was that their, their wickedness had come up before God. So it's, it was, it's here. His will is clear. Number three, it's confrontational. <laughs> it's confrontational. Usually when God tells you to do something, I don't need you to lie on yourself, so don't raise your hand. But how many of us actually get up and go do it? The truth of the matter is, when God tells us to do something, we always got to debate it. Moses did it. He said, well, why me? I can't speak. <laughs> I stutter. I I'm not qualified to do this. I'm, you know. Every time God says to do, it seems that his people, the ones that should act in reflection to him automatically, always have to debate it. And the one thing about his will is although it is confrontational, it ain't going to change. You might not want to do it, but it's going to get done. That's the thing about his will. You can't change it. You can't modify the time of its arrival. You can't even put your opinion in the suggestion box for him to pencil it in anywhere. His will is final. His will is unchangeable. And you cannot escape it. Here it is. It's confrontational. Look at God's perspective. God's perspective is I want you to go. But Jonah's perspective starts with a conditional word that says but. Says that but Jonah rose up and he fleed the opposite way. He forfeited God's plan. He tried to get away from his presence. He tried to get off of his path. He went down to Joppa and he found him a ship. And here's what I need you to understand. It does not matter what you're trying to do. 
you may think that you're only paying a simple cost to flee God, but I need to encourage you, you who have been running, that the cost that you are actually paying is not the fare to get on the transportation to get you there. You ain't hearing me. Here it is. Because while we won't do what the Lord tells us to do and while we try to rewrite the wheel to do what we want to do, I need to tell you that there are costs for your disobedience. Well, what is the cost? Uh, he, one of them is that sin will take you further than you want to go. Uh-huh, how you know it? I've been in sin before. And, and, and Sister Florence, you, you, you take your father and you want to go, keep you longer than you want to be there, and it make you do stuff that you really don't want to do. How you know, Paul, come here. I'm glad y'all want to get quiet. Paul said, I want to do good, and I hate the very thing I find myself doing. Yeah. Sin will take you farther than you want to go. It'll slowly but wholly take control of you. Sin, Sister Melanie, is one of them things that, that, that don't catch you uh, like a cold. It don't catch you like a headache. It catches you more like a cancer. It starts very little. You start doing stuff that you say, oh, you know, we call it a little white sin. You know, it ain't nothing. You know, they got, God will forgive me for that. God knows my heart. That, that, that way, that way, that way, you know, God, know, God knew what he was doing when he made me. He knew what type of person I was when he made. That's how we start. But then the sin starts to snowball. And bro, rolling, you find yourself trying to get out of it. And before you know it, you rolling. And the thing about a snowball effect is it will not stop until it hits a wall. And the longer it can go, the more weight it picks up the bigger it becomes and the faster it rolls. Y'all ain't hearing me. Somebody need to understand that sin ain't nothing to play with. That's why the word said that the wages of it, the cost of it is death. I told y'all I felt the preaching here today. Thank y'all for staying. Here it is. You can't escape God. And why can't you escape God? Because he's an omnipresent God. He's not just a God, bro, Roland, of this world. He's a God of the universe. So you cannot escape what you can't even get outside of. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Somebody called me an astrologer. I'm not an astrologer. Don't put that on me, but I can tell you a few things. I can tell you a few things. I can, I can tell you that, 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 that sin is one of them things that will catch you off guard, take you so far under, and when you're trying to catch your breath, suffocate you to death. And you can't escape him because he is the God of the universe. So there's nowhere you can run that you can hide. You can get your exercise in, though. You can run. You can run. And when God gets ready, thank you, Holy Spirit, he has a power and a will that he can do and express that makes you do what it was you didn't want to do anyway. I'm preaching now. I'm going to go to my seat. Here it is. But while he tried to get away from the presence of the Lord, the Bible says that it was his cowardness. It was his lack of wanting to be obedient to God. It was his lack of faith and forgiveness. It was the results of his rebelliousness. But we see God's power because the Bible says that in verse number four, but the Lord. Y'all see that? While you trying to get outside of his will, I need you to know that there are three words that you need to understand that you might need to take from here today that you're never going to outrun. And those three words are, but the Lord. I don't care how you try to go back and forth with God in your conference meeting and tell God I'm not qualified. God, I can't do it. I'm unlearned. God says, but the Lord. If God is in it, there's nothing that you ever have to worry about for God even told the prophet, you take no thought for what you're going to eat because I'm going to make provision for you because I am the God who wills. Here's in the text. Here it is. The it says, but the Lord, he sent out 
a great win. Here's something about the will of God we need to understand. The will of God is not only here, it's not only clear, it's not only confrontational, and you can't escape it. It shows his correction. His will is correction. Here it is. But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea. I need y'all to help me paint this picture. I'm going to my seat. He didn't necessarily, he prepared this fish for Jonah. But if you notice, the Bible paints it that he sends the fish to the sea. Well, he sends the, the storm, I'm sorry, to the sea. He needs to first disrupt the sea. Because what disrupting the sea will do is whatever's floating on it, it will cause it to also be disrupted. Well, I'm painting the picture for you. The Bible says that when the storm and the great wind came so that the ship was almost about to be broken up, the people on the ship had got afraid. The Bible says that every man, according to the Bible, called out to their little G God. What are you trying to tell me, preacher, as you go to your seat? You better know what God to call on. That, that's why I've been preaching this. I've been trying to tell you who he is. Because we seem to make up little gods. I told you, what are little gods? Things that you make. Your house. Your car. Your kids. Your family. Your husband. Your wife. These things that you put before God becomes your little G-God. So in the text, the Bible says that everybody on the ship calls out to their God. And when they call out to their God, they also began to lighten up the load. When they lighten up the load, they did not realize that what they were going through wasn't even for them. So it didn't matter, Deacon Morris, what they did, they wasn't going to change what God's intent was. God knew that he had a prophet on that ship and that prophet had found himself a, a small little spot to go to sleep on. And so while there's a storm happening, while the, the tempest is coming and the, and the sea is, is raging and, and the ship is almost being broken, and the men are calling on their God, they're casting out their cargoes and they're lighting up their loads. Bible says in verse number five that Jonah had gone down into the lowest part of the ship. He had lain down and was fast asleep. So the captain did what a good captain should do. He searched the ship. And sometimes I'm preaching to somebody here. You got to understand that what you going through might not be because of you. But you better have some good sense in your mind to search your ship and find out what's in it that's causing the problem. Y'all didn't catch that. Let me give it to you one more time. Because some of you in here need to understand that the storm that you have been going through, the late at nights that have been you've been having, the tears that you've been crying, all of that that has not been because of something you've done. But sometimes you got to deal with somebody else's disobedience. And God has to use you to get their attention. And here's what the captain does. The captain searches his ship. And he finds him sleeping. And he says, what do you mean, sleeper? Arise. Call on your capital G, God. I don't know how this captain knew it. <laughs> I don't know, so Sam, how this captain knew that while everybody else is calling on their little G gods, he knows to tell Jonah, but to call on yours. Woo! Thank you, Holy Spirit. I'm going to my seat. He says, call on your God. Perhaps your God will consider us. We didn't call on him, but maybe he'll consider us. 
I'm talking to somebody right now. You ain't reached out to him, but maybe he'll consider you. You ain't called out for his help, but maybe he'll consider you. What you trying to preach? I'm preaching the text. The Bible says that the captain looks at him and tells him, call on your God. Perhaps, you know what perhaps means? Maybe, possibly, your God, because ours ain't done nothing. <laughs> Your God, because we've been calling on hours. You've been down here sleeping and the storm's still happening. Maybe your God will consider us so that we may not be perished. I'm going. And they said to one another, come, let us cast lots that we may know for whose causes this trouble to come up on us. <sighs> so they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. <laughs> then they said to Jonah, please tell me, what is your occupation? Let me stop. Bro, preacher, what does it mean by cast lots? They all went up to the hinder part of the ship and they started all going through the things that they had brought on the ship, things they had thrown off, and they started to evaluate what could be causing this problem? The Bible says, Jasmine, as they were looking at what could be causing this problem, it fell on Jonah. So Jonah says, they said, tell me, uh, what's your occupation? Uh-huh. And then Jonah says, where do you come from? And what, what is your country? And of what people are you? So he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, and the God of heaven. He says, I am a, a Hebrew, and I know what it is that I am, and I know what it is that I'm supposed to be doing. He says, uh, I am a, a Hebrew and I fear the God of heaven who made uh, the sea and the dry land. The Bible says in verse number 10, then the men were exceedingly afraid. And they said to him, uh, Jonah, why have uh, you done this? For men uh, knew that he fled uh, from the presence uh, of the Lord because uh, he had told them uh, that they said, uh, what shall we do to you uh, that the sea may be calm uh, for us? Uh, for the sea was growling uh, more temperous. Uh, and he said, uh, the only way uh, you gonna get peace uh, on this ship uh, is if you pick me up uh, and throw me into the sea. Uh, then uh, the sea will uh, become calm for you uh, for I know uh, that the reason uh, why you're going through this uh, is because of me uh, is there anybody here uh, that don't mind uh, being admitting uh, and telling somebody uh, that I know uh, why you're dealing with what you're dealing with I know uh, why you're going through uh, what you're going through uh, and the only way uh, you gonna be saved uh, the only way uh, you gonna survive uh, if, if you cut me off uh, and throw me overboard uh, and I don't know uh, many people here uh, who would be willing uh, to be cut off uh, from anybody uh, to save them uh, but can I tell you uh, that what Jonah was trying to tell them uh, that the trouble that they was experiencing uh, wasn't because of something that they did uh, but the trouble that they was experiencing uh, was because of his disobedience uh, and the only way uh, they were going to be saved uh, on this ship uh, is that they got rid of uh, that who was being uh, in uh, disobedient. Uh, and the Bible says uh, in verse number 13, uh, nevertheless, uh, the men roared uh, hard to return to the land, uh, but they could not, uh, for the sea continued to grow more timorous uh, against them. Uh, but I heard uh, somewhere uh, around verse number 17 uh, that while Jonah uh, had been thrown into the fire, into the 
water while Jonah had been gotten rid of as a result of his disobedience. I heard the Bible say that God prepared a fish for Jonah and the Bible said that this fish swallowed him up into the belly of the well and he stayed there three days and three nights as I go to my seat and I end part one of this message I need to tell you that three is a magic number because sometimes it don't take all day sometimes it won't take all week but sometimes it just is being in the presence of the Lord for just a few days Jonah was in the belly of the fish in Jonah chapter number two and he began to cry out to the Lord Lord why don't you save me and the Bible said three days later anybody here the Bible said three days later that what got Jonah into the belly of the whale what got Jonah because of his disobedience having to have a fish prepared for him was not to kill him but it was to bring him back to the remembrance of who he was and whose he was and all he had to remember was God in the moment of his despair and I see that fish coming about the water over on the shore and spitting Jonah out Bible said that what should have taken Jonah a few days Jonah made and only a day and a half and it was all because when God has a will you can't outrun it you can't do nothing for it all you can do is surrender to it and say Lord here I am if you need me to go I'll do your will Lord I might not like it but it's your calling on my life and can I tell you somebody else who almost gave up on coming here can I tell you if you look in the garden of Gethsemane you'll find a man by the name of Jesus Christ he's praying Lord let this cup pass from me that's not my will but thine will be done let me go ahead hop across the river don't you know one Friday on a hill called Calvary he hung he bled and he died and he died from the sixth to the ninth hour sun refused to shine moon turned into blood stars fell out their silver sockets the centurion looks up and said surely he must be the son of God they took him down laid him in a tomb told you three days was a special thing stayed there all day Friday all day Saturday but right early Sunday morning he got up all power in his hand didn't he do it do you know him Mary's baby, uh, Joanna's grandson, uh, Lily of the Valley, uh, bright morning star, uh, way uh, out of no way, uh, bridge uh, over troubled waters, uh, stone, uh, hewed out yonder's mountain, uh, my wheel uh, in the middle of a wheel, uh, John's horse uh, pouring down in the valley, uh, do you know him, uh, I know him, uh, I call him, uh, I cry, uh, he answers, uh, he comes by, he sees about me, and he takes care takes care he takes care of me because it's his will his will is that if he says go our job is to go don't worry about what you're going to do don't worry about how you're going to get there what you need to do what God is telling you to do just go. The problem with the churches now is that we thought that it was the pastor's job to go, but didn't realize that the pastor's job was to emphasize what the Lord says to all of those that were here and do his work. Not just for me to go, but for us to go. The only problem is. He's told us to go. And so many of us are still arguing with him on how to get there and what to do when we get there. He told his prophet, he says, and be not afraid of their faces. For lo, I am with you always. 
Here's your bonus about his will. It is always accessible. All you got to do, search your heart. How, what that mean, bro, preacher? Your word have I hid in it. If I hide the word of God in my heart, then it's just saying what I'm really doing is carrying his will. And all I got to do is, is hear his voice. When he says do, I do. When he says go, I go. When he says say, I say. Because it is the will of our God. What is his will in simple? This is part one. We'll deal with part two next week. What is his will in simple? That all of us come to the point of salvation. And there can be no salvation without repentance. If you're not willing to repent, then honey, you really ain't willing to be saved. God ain't trying to save you in your mess. He's trying to carry you and pick you up out of it. Now he'll meet you right where you are, but he ain't coming there to stay too long. He's stopping by to pick you up. And you got two options. Get in or stay in your mess. God's will, God's way. If it's his will that we go out and compel men, women, boy, and girl, then who are we to argue with him on how, what, and who to go to? He says, if you're willing to go, just say, send me. I'll go. When you say that, you're not saying, send me, I'll go, but give me the directions, God. What you're saying is, send me wherever you want me to go and I'll go and do whatever you want me to do. Amen. God bless you. God, give God a hand clap of praise in this place today. God's will, God's way. Join us next week as we deal with God's will part two. After we deal with God's will, we're going to be dealing with the works of God. After we deal with God's will, we'll deal with the works of God. My prayer and God's prayer is that, well, my prayer and that God's direction and instruction is that after we know who he is, know his nature, know his will, know his works, that maybe, just maybe, we'll want to praise him better, praise him more. Because I have a saying here, and I've been saying this forever. This, this goes to our Sunday school and our Wednesday night Bible study. How can you come in on Sunday mornings and worship a God that you don't know nothing about? And the truth about it, on average, a person going to pick up their Bible maybe once in seven days. You don't believe it? Evaluate how much you do. And think that everybody ain't like you. There's some folk who don't pick it up at all. The only time they really read it is if they see you. Y'all didn't catch that. Amen. Be the word. Walk the word. Express the word. Because it is the will of our God. The doors of the church are open. And if you are here, whether you are here, you want to join us in membership and partnership here at this church because God has spoken to you and he says that somewhere in this church you are here to work, you are here to serve, you are here to give what gift you have and, and he's spoken to you maybe over the course of some weeks, maybe he needs to continue to speak to you. The opportunity is open for you uh, to come and, and to reunite or to unite uh, with the family that is the Antioch Primitive Baptist Church. Uh, we, we, don't, we don't need a lot of stuff. All we need you to do to say is that I want to be a part of family. And when you say I want to be a part of family, you're already willing to serve. If you're willing to serve, then I promise you, there's work to be done. If you, if you don't want to come and unite with us, maybe you desire prayer. Maybe you have been seeking God for something. You're saying, God, I need you to speak to me. I need you to answer. I need you to do it, whether it's through the word. Maybe it's through a confirmation, through prayer. God, whatever it is, I need you to speak to me. And I need
need y'all to understand that sometimes the only way God is going to speak is when you get right quiet and still and align yourself with him and his voice. Clear out all the distractions and just let it be you and God. Maybe you don't uh, have prayer. Maybe you uh, don't want to unite yourself with this church in the way of, of, of just being here. Maybe you want to give yourself to baptism. Maybe you want to be baptized. Maybe you want to show on the outside of the inward change. Maybe you want to show people on the outside that I'm willing to do exactly what Jesus did. Showing exactly what Jesus showed. That there's a God in me that's willing me to do. And I'm only going to do it if he causes it to happen. By letter, by Christian experience, candidate for baptism, or that you just wish to be prayed for. Doesn't matter how you come, we say, just come. Doesn't matter who looking, don't care what they thinking, doesn't, just come. Whatever it is that you desire, God is a God. God can God will there's a plan and there's a will for your life that God has already set out and no matter what it is he knew before there was a win or a win and the only thing you have to do is follow in what God gives what he tells if there's anybody else, let us stand just for a quick second, just for a few seconds. Those who are able, if you're here, don't let this moment pass you by. Today is the day of salvation. Tomorrow belongs to the Lord. If you want to come as a candidate for baptism, you can come. If you want to come, Christian experience, you can come. If you want to come by letter, you can come. If you want to reach You don't want to do it publicly. You can find me in my office when all of this is done. And you can just say, hey, I want to be here. My sin. Don't let this moment pass you by. Clear your minds of the why and the what. And let's approach the throne of grace. Lord, I come to thee. Knowing that God came. Else. Don't let this moment pass you by. Lord, I need thee. Don't let this moment pass you by. Today is the day of salvation. Tomorrow belongs to the Lord. Every hour, Lord. Lord. Don't let this moment pass you by. sister or brother, and I always say this, is in need of anything. The truth is, all of us are in the same need. When our sister is hurting, all of us are hurting. When our sisters and brothers are confused and they're seeking answers, all of us are confused and seeking answers. The only advantage we have is that while the devil is trying to blind the eyes of those seeking it, God opens the heart of those who know how to get to it. What are you trying to tell us, Brother Preacher? Don't care the whys, the what's, and the, I want to know what is going on. Simply, just pray. Just pray. You ain't got to know. God knows. That's why I said you ain't got to know. God knows. So you can literally tell God whatever it is, God will apply it to where he needs to go. But just 
Just pray. You want to stand up for a minute? Bless your heart. Let us pray. Turn to God our Father. God, whatever it is, one day just stands in the need. God, we ask that you give it. You bless her with it. God's strength, give it to her. Understanding, give it to her. A clear mind to be able to operate and know what duties and responsibilities lie in her hand. God, give it to her. But no, and let her know that she's not by herself. That God, all she really has to do is lean, depend, and put it all in your hands. When she wake up, put it all in your hand. When she's going about her day, put it all in your hand. When she go to sleep at night, put it all in your hands. God, we know that faith without works is dead, but there are some people who are operating knowing that you can, but they need you to help their unbelief. God, bless them in ways that we don't know they need blessed. Touch them in ways that we don't know that they need touched. God, make their health be impeccable. Make it, make it be to the best that it could ever be. God, for we know uh, the, 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 the responsibilities and the duties that they should have. God, we know the things that she's having to, the journey she's having to go on, the things she's having to deal with. God, we know that you also know that this was planned before Deja knew who she was. Before there was a when or a where, God, you chose her for such a time as this. And although it may not look good and feel good sometimes, it is good because God is willing it to happen. For if it wasn't for God's will, it wouldn't come to be. There's a purpose, there's a plan for everything. God, we ask that you reveal your purpose, your plan to her right now. That she don't have to come and try to worship herself into a place of answers. She don't have to try to, 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 to go with the church movements to try and find answers. And all she really got to do is call Jesus. The Bible says, and I've implied it, or the Bible implies it, and I've, I've experienced that when you call Jesus, situations change. When you call Jesus, the atmosphere around you will change. When you call Jesus where you were weak, now you're strong. When you call Jesus where you did not know, now you know. When you call on Jesus when you did not have, now you have an abundance of. God, I'm reminded of the woman who told the prophet, God, all I have is a little meal. Prophet said, you feed me first. Have faith. Watch what God will do. Find out that when I, you feed the prophet, you got more to go. Because God is the God of abundance. But you got to abide by his will. So God, teach Deja how to know your will. Teach her how to seek your will. Teach her how to live according to your will. Not going to happen tomorrow. Might not even happen next month. And the truth is, it might not happen next year. But God, I stand on this day of November. And I'm declaring that it shall be done. Whatever it is that Deja is praying about and seeking for, this too shall pass. She serves a God that has a will. And his will is that all his children be saved and have the same right and advantages and access to him that his son Jesus Christ has. God bless her from the top of her head to the sole of her feet. As far as she's to rest her arms out left to right, east from west, God bless her and allow her to give her body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto you. She's not perfect, God, and I know you know that. But thank you for being a perfect God who hasn't given up on her. God, we thank you. God, we bless you. God, we rejoice and we celebrate and we praise you in saying amen, amen, amen. God bless you. God is able to do just what he said. 
he would do. You can be seated, brother. Thank you. He's gonna fulfill. Let us stand. Every promise. Minister Roland, promise to you. Don't give up on God. Cause he won't give up on you. He's able. Do y'all believe that? Do y'all believe that? I'm a true believer from experience. I know that. He's able. Let's do it one round. Everybody in this place, you know the words. Let's lift it up to God. Give him one praise. God is able. God is able. Praise for Minister Rosen as he comes and as God gives him whatever application that he's to lay on us today, he prays us out of here, but not before I give the benediction. Now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, may the love of God and the sweet communion of his grace abide with us henceforth and forevermore. Let every heart say after the prayer has gone before. Amen. sit here and listen to the message that was preached, God, God began to remind me of how I got here. He reminded me of my stubbornness. He reminded me of my unwillingness to, to bend. He reminded me of my own personal fish. I pray that none of you will have that fish. If you do have that fish, and I pray that you will submit to the Lord immediately. Because as some ministers know, the longer you run, the worse it gets. Jonah ran and he found a storm. And then he found a fish. And he sat in that belly of that fish for three days. I can't imagine what that, what that would have been like, but I know that was not pleasant. I think about what I went through before I, be, before I became a minister and, and what the Lord allowed me to go through. Very unpleasant. I don't want anybody to go through that. I don't know if you've ever been through a depression, but it's miserable. Everything is black. There's no joy. There's no hope. There's no happiness. You just you don't want to live. Fortunately for me, the, the thought of taking my life never came. But just sitting in that misery was enough that I had to say, I yield, I yield, I yield. Once I did, I found peace. I found joy. And I found motivation. Because although Pastor didn't, didn't cover it, later on, Jonah got out that fish. And he ran. And he shouted. He let the people know that this city is going to be destroyed. He didn't waste no time because he had that motivation. So if any of you are going through anything like that, I urge you to submit, yield, and let the Lord have his way. So if you don't mind, would y'all just follow me to the Lord? And let's close our eyes and bow our heads one more time. Dear, merciful, loving Heavenly Father, we come to you as humble as we know how before your mighty throne. And we just want to say thank you for the message that was preached, Lord. We want to say thank you, Lord, for, for the for the man of God that stood up here and gave us the truth. We want to say thank you, Lord, for the for the blessings that you have bestowed upon us this entire year, and you allowed us to see another Thanksgiving. We want to say thank you, Lord, for our friends and our family that were that are still here. We want to say thank you, Lord, for the love and the memories that we had for the for the loved ones who, who have passed on. Lord, we just want to say thank you for mercy and your grace that we can't we can't go without it Lord so we thank you Lord for each and every day that you that you bestow that mercy and grace upon us Lord and in Jesus name let us say amen amen, amen.